started. I always look forward to our next speaker, Dr. Boyd Haley. He's a research scientist and international lecturer with a PhD in biochemistry and chemistry. He's the foreman chairman, de department, chairman department of chemistry at the University of Kentucky. He has numerous research studies published in peer-reviewed medical scientific journals. He has testified at the United States House of Representatives Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. He is one of the main characters in Randall Moore's documentary. Uh, please give a warm Academy welcome to Dr. Boyd Haley. They've got to test me first. Am I on? No, okay. Uh, I'll read this little uh, disclaimer. Uh, uh, I do, I'm going to present some data on a compound called uh, NBMI that uh, uh, can be used to prevent the toxic effects of mercury. It'll be some of the slides in here. I'm not trying to sell it, and I don't tell you anything about it, but just to show that there is some hope that we can go out and uh, prevent the toxic effects of mercury and, and explain some of the data that's coming up. So I do have, uh, I own CPI Science, and uh, we are uh, developing a drug, and we used to call it OSR. I know some of you, or a lot of you, have used it in the past. Uh, I also want to point out that this is my opening statement. I mean, we have a, a, a government that's, uh, if it's not corrupt, it sure as hell acts like it. <clears throat> The, the, the point is, I'm going to be talking a lot about science, because that's what I am. I'm not a lawyer. But I want to tell you, my attitude toward our FDA, the American Dental Association, the Center for Disease Control, is that we have to get non-government organizations to take them to court, to make them behave in a proper fashion. They are not doing that today. And so, even though I uh, am a strong proponent of science, I don't think all the science in the world that I could produce and the amount that has already been produced would be uh, accurately and honestly evaluated by our government. So uh, if, uh, I support Jim Love and the other people, Bob Reeves, who say we have to take them to court because the, the data is overwhelming. It's been overwhelming for the last 10 years, and they just ignore it. And, now, and they've caused us to have a lot of seri serious problems because uh, you can go to a, an NIH website, look up Alzheimer's disease, and they'll give you a list of all the drugs that the NIH and other people have supported and looked at to treat Alzheimer's disease, and they've all failed. Sometimes they cure Alzheimer's by killing the patient, but that's the best they got, and yet they will not even address, not one public, not one project there is looking at the effect of mercury, a known neurotoxin with grams in your mouth, and with proof that we have had for years that it will mimic the same uh, biochemical abnormalities as you see in the Alzheimer's disease brain. So at the very least, it would be an exacerbating factor if not a primary causal factor. And so the talk today I mean, is going to try and get you to address the issue of the effect of mercury on biomembrane because this is the first sign, first step in mercury-induced toxicity that causes a lot of the illnesses. For example, the previous speaker, and I really enjoyed both speakers, but the one on oxytocin. Oxytocin is low in autistic children. Oxidative stress is high in all autistic children. The urinary porphyrin profiles are inhibited. They don't make enough heme. That's the reason why they're white. There is, there's a plethora of biochemical abnormalities. Now, why did these increase in 1990? I mean, why do we go along? And we didn't have autism before 1940 when we induced the mercury compounds that are common in the body. So I have no doubts about all these things that are reported, oxytocin, they don't make methyl B12, etc. But what single thing could cause all that? And what I'm going to show you today is it's the basic toxicity of mercury to biomembranes that leads to a lot of the problems that many of you experience, your children experience, and is associated with certain diseases. So first of all, I, I've got to do a, 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 slow, a, a light level of education. And we talk, when we talk in biochemistry, we talk about primitive biochem systems. 
A primitive biochem system is one that has to exist in every cell that's ever lived, the most primitive cell. In this particular one, every primitive system has to have an ATP or energy producing system such as glycolysis or an electron transport system. If you inhibit that system, like with cyanide, you die. The cell dies. You have to have it. The second one is a metal transport system such as the sodium potassium ATPase that maintains the salt gradient across the biomembrane. If you inhibit that, like with wallbane or curare, you know, when they shoot the monkey with a dart in a tree and he dies, because if you, don't, if you can't transport salt, your nerves don't work, and you die. The third one is a reducing system, such as the glutathione system in our body, that keeps the intracellular space in a reduced state so that the sulfurs can exist and catalyze a lot of the essential reactions in the body. Now this one, you can slow it down a bit, and you don't die. You just get sick. It takes a long time. Now, if you totally eliminate it, you'll die. But this is the one that is disturbed in almost all the uh, systemic illnesses that we have today. <coughs> and this is the one we're going to be talking a lot about. And surrounding these two systems is a semi-permeable lipid bilayer membrane, the cell membrane of a single cell. And uh, this is the one that allows, that excludes all the stuff that would go in, such as free iron, Mercury, supposedly, and other things that would, uh, would, would affect the, the, uh, 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 the biochemistry and health of the body. Now, as we live, we've evolved to some uh, uh, advanced systems that allow a mammalian life to exist. We're not a single cell. So we start stacking cells together to make membranes that allow us to become much more complex. And I realize this is the P. V. Herman version of biochemistry of cell membranes and organelle function. But this is well, all you have to understand to do it. Like the hormone activated system. I don't know what all these buttons are for. Oh, here's my own pointer. Okay. Hormone activated systems such as the oxytocin. You know, uh, we've developed these by making things. The, more, well, the one I wanted to talk about more is the thyroid gland. Because we all make hormones. We all have to have... Uh, you know, thyroid hormones. And that is surrounded by a membrane that allows that organ to exist and function properly and release uh, thyroid hormone when we need it. So we have, a, a, again, a very uh, complex system and different organs used to produce biological response agents, thyroid, adrenal, cleanse, kidneys, etc., protect the immune system, blood-brain barrier, and repair the body are surrounded by what we call cell membranes. And they're very complex. And this is what we're going to tell you is that mercury first attacks this type of thing. All of the above organs and glands are compartmentalized by cell membranes with specific properties. They're also more susceptible to attacks by toxins like methylmercury, mercury, and vapor, and, and due to matrix attacks that are involved. So in this particular process, you've got to understand the membrane definitions. In an individual cell, there's the lipid bilayer that surrounds each individual cell, and the mitochondria inside the cell has also lipid bilayers that surround it. We have the mitochondrial membrane. And this bilayer keeps out most toxic materials of the cell away from the nucleus, mitochondria, and other organelles. It worked really well until humans inhabited the earth, started mining mercury and, and certain other things and putting it into the atmosphere, so it cannot keep mercury out. Mercury will penetrate this lipid bilayer with a great deal of ease. Now, we have their several cellular membranes that consist of the cells lined together, forming tight junctions between them and compartmentalizing an organ like the thyroid gland or a system like the intestinal tract or our veins and arteries. It's critical in the human body that you keep the immune system away from the inside of your thyroid. It's critical that you keep foods in your intestine from going into your bloodstream without being totally digested. And what we're going to tell you is that a lot of the, quote, immune diseases, autoimmune diseases we talk about is caused by a leaky gut that allows partially digested peptides from food to enter the bloodstream and your immune system sees them as a foreign body and develops antibodies to them. And then all of a sudden, and if you keep eating that food and you keep adding that peptide, your bloodstream to that same site, 
you end up with a, a tremendous leaky gut syndrome, Crohn's disease, and uh, items like that. It's actually by the leaky membrane, you are increasing the body's attack on itself. So here's, this came from Dr. Perinati, because we've done some work on this, and we're going to be talking about these membranes. This is the lipid bilayer membrane. It surrounds a single individual cell. But in the arteries and in the intestines, I mean the intestinal epithelial membrane and the endothelial membrane of the arteries, they line up and we call this a cell membrane where these cells have very tight junctions and they control what goes through the cells by this paracellular or transcellular transport process. And what we're going to show you is that if you add mercury to this, the first thing it does is it activates an enzyme like matrix metalloproteinase which chews up the collagen which is found to hold these cells in their tight structure and when you, lo when you destroy this matrix these cells become leaky and then things that are kept outside in an intact membrane now leak through with no problem and say a food product or peptide coming through this membrane hitting here getting into the basal lateral side or the blood side it's going to run into your immune system your immune system is going to come up interact with that and what does it do it starts releasing hydroxy radicals to kill that bacteria but if there's no bacteria there and just a peptide it kills these cells and you end up with a lesion or you know a gut dysbiosis site at that location same thing happens in the artery except it leads to a naprosporotic plaque so, so the comp the concept here yeah, i need something to drink my mouth is getting really dry uh, can somebody bring me a coffee or a water? That would be fine. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and, and this is really what happens with mercury toxicity is you totally blow the hell out of the compartmentalization aspects of your body. Your gut becomes leaky, your arteries become leaky, your, your blood-brain barrier becomes leaky, and even the, the aspect of your thyroid gland becomes leaky. And you end up with problems, but the essence of the problem and the start of the problem comes from toxins that cause these membranes to not function properly. So compartmentalization is a key issue that, uh, I don't know if they teach this in medical school or not, I taught medical school biochemistry, and I thought we taught you guys trivial pursuit. I mean, it wasn't really how you do it. So we have, uh, so to get something across the membrane, for example, we have specific carriers on the, on the intestinal side of the gut that binds manganese, binds the iron, and binds the metals that we need, the essential metals we need, and this limits the amount that gets into it. So when you eat a big steak, loaded with iron most of that iron doesn't go in the body we don't maintain that if you have leaky gut you get a lot more inside and it's toxic free iron iron overload disease can come from that but for example iron and manganese have to be bound by a specific carrier protein for example ferritin iron before they can cross the epithelial membrane of the intestine if you have leaky gut some's going to go through that leaky area not bound and that iron is toxic Free iron in the body is extremely toxic. It is, the, it is the site of the production of most of the hydroxy radicals that we run into. So when we start getting leaky gut, we have all kinds of problems that are caused by metals as well as other proteins, peptides that can cross the epithelial membrane of the enzymes, I mean of the intestines, and they're not supposed to be there. And we have shown very quick, very carefully mercury, methylmercury, and thimerosal have been shown to destroy such tight membrane structures causing leakiness and entry of toxic materials. Now many of you have seen Dr. Wakefield's research where he talked about the intestinal problems associated with autistic children. And I, I, I mean, I think his observations were correct. I think it was caused by the thimerosal and the vaccine, not necessarily the, the viral uh, components of the, of the um, body. So the biomembranes in our body are the first line of defense. In the intestines, we have an epithelial membrane, restricts entrance into the blood of undigested foods, metal not bound to carrier proteins, and other materials that might be toxic. In a cardiovascular system, 
It is the aortic endothelial cell membranes that prevents leakage of tissue components into the blood that will cause an immune response and entry into specific cells of blood materials not meant to be taken up by tissue cells. Indeed, all organs, the thyroid gland, the blood-brain barrier, have membranes that protect against the entry of unwanted and toxic agents that make it into the blood. And it is the destruction of these membranes by toxic oxidative stress-inducing agents that lead to many illnesses. Mercury is one of the most effective toxins to introduce this membrane breakdown. So then we talk about, we talk about collateral damage. The inability to make oxytocin would be one. You just saw that. I mean, I believe that data. I've read those papers. But oxytocin didn't all of a sudden stop being produced in 1990 when the autism epidemic went through the ceiling. Maybe we have to look for something outside the body, such as the increase in the vaccines at that time by the mandated CDC vaccine program to cause a drop in oxytocin levels. So ingested mercury first damages the intestinal epithelial membrane by disrupting the tight junctions. We're going to talk about some research showing this, causing the equivalent of leaky gut syndrome by formation of leaky junctions or loss of intestinal compartmentalization. And the mechanism of this damage, you understand when you do this, you not only just allow peptides to go through, you allow bacteria to go through. You allow virus to set up housekeeping. There are all kinds of problems that are collateral to the first damage done when, you're, when your intestinal epithelium becomes leaky. There's tons of problems that can result from this. And uh, like we, we say, the incomplete digestive food peptides that are usually prevented. And we call these adverse foods, food response or food allergies. How many of you have gone and had your blood tested, pulled out, and they test it and say, oh, you're, you know, you're toxic to casein, you're toxic to uh, uh, walnuts, etc. You're going to be toxic to whatever you eat because whatever you eat is going to produce peptides that are going to end up in the blood and your body is, immune system is going to react to that like it should. Once you clear up that, uh, the leaky membranes in the intestine, these food allergies will, will dissipate and go down quite a bit. But just think about it. Why do we have all of these adverse effects to food? Why do we have all these antibodies to the foods that we're eating, the foods we like to eat? That's the start of an illness. You are, and people say, well, you have an, we have an immune system disorder. Well, yeah, you sure as hell do. I mean, you're throwing everything from the garbage dump into your immune system, and it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Your immune system doesn't just decide someday to go wild on you. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. But you start putting food peptides from the leaky gut into the bloodstream, and you're going to develop antibodies to every food that you eat. It's just going to end up that way. The more you eat it, and, and also a lot of it, I'm sure it's more complex than what I'm saying here, but we have it. But we call these an autoimmune response or immune disease, and there's papers, an article in the paper just recently saying, autism is an autoimmune disease. Like in 1990, all of the immune systems, by some... Uh, telepathic type of thing decide let's start going wild on all these kids that's not it you have to have common sense why did the autism rate go up in Alaska Hawaii Florida California Maine and everything in between at the same time and the only you have to say well what's consistent with inducing this type of problem this type of increase in the autoimmune response I mean the data they're reporting is this but they've got to go down and say we have got to fight toxins out of our bodies and we have an FDA and a CDC that's got their head stuck in the sand so far that they will not look and use common sense and this is common sense this is not hard hardcore uh, uh, wild speculation <clears throat> so if we talk about how collateral damage is done by mercury toxic to biomembranes which is what I'm doing certain metals like iron manganese copper and zinc are limited in their uptake you eat too much of these things. They say, well, you're stored on sometimes, and they're essential metals. You absolutely do need these metals. These metals never enter your body in the free form, accurate. They are bound by specific carrier proteins that transport them across the gut, and then sometimes they're exchanged, and then they're carried to the sites where they're needed, bound to specific proteins. They are not free. The minute you break down that barrier, then you're getting a flux of these metals in the preform, they're toxic, and they're going into your body. Thalassemia, iron overload disease, etc., are situations in which you have more metal in your body than you have protein, specific protein to bind them. 
and you end up with a disease state. When you start making hydroxy radicals and have an inflammation, remember, you have to have a metal to make hydroxy radicals. You have to have something that can give up and take electrons in a cyclic process to make a lot of hydroxy radicals. That is done by free iron. Iron is bound in hemoglobin, etc. It doesn't do that at all. So these metals in the free state are toxic, and when we lose this, we start seeing it. And in the latest study on Alzheimer's disease, they have excess zinc above what is normal in the body, excess copper, excess iron. So we are destroying our ability to keep these essential metals locked up in the state where they're working for us instead of working against us. So uh, it's important that you remember that essential metals, copper and zinc in the free state, can induce severe oxidative stress due to their electron donating capacity. For example, when people tell you that uh, vitamin C is a pro-oxidant, it's an antioxidant, but it's an electron donor. But if you have free iron, it'll donate that electron to free iron, that free iron will donate it to superoxide anion, and you'll end up producing hydroxy radicals. So, you know, vitamin C is not a pro-oxidant unless you have free iron or free copper in your body. So, uh, and I would point out that macrophages that collect at the le leaky epithelial membranes and do so release of hydroxy is through my myeloperoxidase, producing free radicals to kill perceived foreign body invasions and thereby damaging the intestinal membrane even further. Such damage causes the leak of, I mean, the, the loss of compartmentalization, symbiotic bacteria, enzymes, and others that are needed for proper food digestion. Mercury making it into blood causes damage to the arterial endothelial membrane, leading to atherosclerotic plaques and other signs of cardiovascular disease. I mean, the atherosclerotic plaques start out as your endothelial membrane that's keeping your blood where it's supposed to be, it's keeping your immune system from attacking the cells on the other side of the blood uh, uh, barrier. And when you lose that, the immune system attacks that, and then you end up with a big lesion, and then the body runs in with uh, cholesterol, etc., that gets oxidized because you're producing oxidative stress there. And you get oxidized cholesterol, you get a buildup of calcium and other proteins, as well as periodontal disease bacteria like it because you have a lesion, you have an opening there. And that's how you form an atherosclerotic plaque. First thing that has to happen, you have to break that endothelial membrane. Mercury will do this, methylmercury will do this, and so we need to look at this. And, and we can say, when you get this site and you get this damage going, and then all of a sudden if you have periodontal disease or jawbone osteonecrosis and these bacteria from your mouth are collecting in your bloodstream and going around, they're not gonna set up housekeeping in the good part of your artery. They're gonna go to these lesions and we find these bacteria uh, in the periodontal tract. And some people say they don't know whether it causes it or just harbors it there, but it definitely exacerbates that aspect because if you have them there, the immune system is gonna attack them more and they're gonna repeat more and you're gonna have toxins produced by these bacteria that are not good. So, if you look at this paper, this is from oral microbiology. I'm saying, I threw this in because you're a bunch of, a lot of you dentists. Uh, uh, these results give evidence for a specific immune response associated with atherosclerosis. Whether bacteria initiate the observed inflammation in atherosclerotic lesions is not clear. However, the present study shows that the maintenance of inflammation may, may be enhanced by the presence of periodontopathic bacteria. And what they're talking about is the atherosclerotic plaque. There is an association with dental uh, uh, oral uh, hygiene and uh, health uh, and the formation of these. But I think they don't start it so much, although they could. Some of the periodontal bacteria are incredibly toxic. And if they get into your bloodstream uh, uh, to a certain level, they're going to they're gonna destroy your membranes. They definitely, have the, they definitely have the toxic capability. I don't think it's just all totally uh, mercury. We have to say, well, how do, how do we know that mercury and organic mercury cause the breakdown of biomembranes? I'm gonna, this is what this whole talk, the rest of the talk's gonna be about because you have to make sense. You have to walk out of here saying, well, he's not just waving his hands and showing us there's science behind this. Uh, mercury compounds can penetrate the lipophilic cell bilayers with great ease, nothing. 
a matter of fact, it prefers it. Mercury gas, mercury vapor, is a hydrophobic atom. It likes being in oil more than it likes being in water. So when you breathe it, that's the reason 80% of it stays in your body. You are a pile of oil uh, as, as, as the mercury looks at you. You're not water. You have a lot of lipid, your nasal mucosa, the oral mucosa in the mouth, absorbs mercury like crazy. And, and when it gets inside, and this is going to be the new part of this that uh, has come out and has been a, a, a good publication, the cells that you have have different levels of negative charges on the outside versus the inside. On all cell membranes, the inside is more negative than the outside. And this is, this is a, a, what, what determines your membrane potential. I don't know how many of you took a lot of physiology. You can lose a lot of sleep look, working in the Nernst equation, which we'll talk about. But what happens when mercury gets in, it gets converted to HG2+. The 2 plus is attracted, attracts chloride ions. You have 135 millimolar, roughly, chloride in your blood. So what's, the mercury doesn't run around your blood as HG2+. Plus. It goes around as HGCl+, plus, HGCl2 neutral. And that HGCl2 neutral goes right through the membrane with no problem at all. And it's pulled through there by the increased amount of negative charges inside of your cells. And what this causes, as we're going to talk about, is a 5.6-fold increase in mercury inside the cell versus what's in the plasma if you calculate it using the Nernst equation, which is used to calculate that type of thing. And that's pretty bad. And that's the reason when you give a kid a shot of Tamarasol, that within six hours, 75% of the mercury is gone from the body, and he, it's not in his urine. It's in his body. It's concentrating inside the cells. Now, the, the frightening thing about this is that the cell membrane is kind of small compared to the mitochondrial membrane, which is 150, 185 millivolts. The mercury that gets inside your cell now can see the mitochondria. It goes to the mitochondrial membrane, and it is increased a thousandfold inside the mitochondria if you apply the Nernst equation to that application. So the mercury is actually pulled by the structure of your body from the blood into the mitochondria at a very, very high level. Now, this is why when some of you guys who do DMPS treatment, you treat somebody with DMPS, you see a very significant increase, sometimes 10 to 80 fold of mercury in their urine. Looks like you're getting a lot out. But two hours after you quit that, after that's over, your blood levels are right back to where they were because there's such a large amount of mercury stored inside the body of a person that's been chronically exposed for years, you can't get it out by just pulling it out of the blood. You, would take, you can get it out, but it takes a long, long time. And for those of you who say, well, I see an, impo I see an improvement within uh, a day or two of doing DMPS treatment, you do, because you are improving the, the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is another membrane that you can get to, and you can see an improvement very quickly there. So I, I'm not knocking doing chelation at all, but I'm telling you the fact is, in, in uh, the Philippines, they did 95 miners that were acutely mercury toxic, most of them. And what they did is they treated them for 14 days with 400 milligrams of DMPS every day, and the level of mercury they executed was significant. But after they left and came back, two days later, their blood and urine levels were right where they were before they started. So you were emptying it, but the redistribution from inside the cell to the outside indicated you didn't move, they didn't remove a significant amount of mercury at all. And at the same time, some of the patients that were treated said they got a lot better. So I'm not being negative about doing this kind of thing. Okay. So here's, here's the picture of the cartoon. And this is the lipid bilayer we're talking about on a single cell. It's impermeable to most charged compounds unless you have a carrier. Mercury vapor is not charged, goes straight through, gets converted to HG2+, and attacks the mitochondria. Methylmercury, straight through, ethylmercury, straight through. <clears throat> I mean, there, it's no barrier. We did not uh, evolve on the face of the earth breathing mercury vapor or injecting thimerosal into human bodies. We, did, we, we don't have protection against this kind of thing. And we have chelators, and DMPS and DMSA and some of the other chelators that use even EDTA cannot go through these membranes. They stick on the outside. They'll take mercury out of the components in the blood, but they do not get inside the, the uh, cell. 
effectively, and they also do not get inside the mitochondria. And this is the problem we have because as mercury becomes toxic, collects at a thousand-fold level here versus here in the mitochondria, it starts producing a huge amount of hydroxy radicals, which induces a lot of illnesses, inflammation. And if you want to check this out, just Google your favorite disease and oxidative stress in the same line, and you'll see it's associated with almost every illness that's known as this system and neurological. So what we're going to talk about later, uh, I mean, and throughout this thing, is inside the cell, why do we do this? Now look at the, note that the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle and the electron transport system are located in the mitochondria ma ma matrix and inner membrane providing maximum shielding from blood toxins. In other words, any toxin that's out here has to not only make it through this lipid bilayer, it has to make it through the lipid bilayer that surrounds the mitochondria. And that's tough to do. So what we can say is toxic mercury, organic mercury, are not prevented from any, entering any compartment of the body. And if you're going to make a toxin or a chelator that's going to work effectively, you've got to have a chelator that is not limited in its ability to chase mercury down to where mercury goes. In other words, it has to be hydrophobic. Uh, and, and what we can say also, because these are positively charged, uh, they are concentrated from the blood into the compartments by a physiological ph phenomena supported by the membrane potential. And this is the kind of physiology you would find in every physiological test that, text that you would use. And we can say, is there scientific evidence that mercury effectively crosses these bilayers and biomembranes of cell phone? And the answer, there's tons of it. For example, you all listen to the, some of you listen to the Geyer's talk, and you talk about people such as autistic children that do not make because their porphyrin profile is inhibited. The porphyrin profile, where it's inhibited by mercury, is on the inner aspect of the mitochondrial membrane. So if mercury inhibits the production of porphyrin, and this is what James Woods and a lot of other people have published, and a lot of you are very much aware of with the data that the IUMT generated showing that mercury inhibits this pathway, the vapor from mercury inhibits this pathway, what you're seeing is that this pathway is inhibited and it's blocked here on the inner membrane and you couldn't inhibit this unless you get there. So that means you go right, mercury goes right through the lipid bilayer of an individual cell and inhibits porphyrin synthesis. Autistic children have been well shown to have not make enough heme. If you look at them, they're very pale. If you measure the urinary porphyrin profile, you'll see that this particular, uh, these particular urinary porphyrins I mean, are elevated and uh, uh, because of the blockage, they build up and they get put into the urine instead of converted into heme. And the point being made, since conic mercury exposure inhibits porphyrin pathway at the site of the inner membrane, so we know the mercury gets there based on the urinary porphyrin profile. No doubt about it at all. And this is the work that was published just recently by James Wood, who first said that this uh, mercury didn't, uh, amalgam didn't have any effect, now he's changed his mind. And uh, it says, and I don't want to read all this because I know most of you have read it, uh, among girls, fused, it, but it, it only happens in boys. But you have to have this CPOX4 uh, genetic interaction that makes you more sensitive. And so these findings are the first that demonstrate genetic susceptibility to the adverse neural behavior effects of mercury exposure in children. The mercury they're talking about here is mercury from dental amalgam. So the children's amalgam trial that you get thrown in your face with the FDA-based their idea that amalgams are safe for everyone because that's what they first concluded has now been stood on its head. There are people, and primarily, if not entirely, boys, that are very susceptible to mercury toxicity and the ability to produce heme. And so you have to look at this. Girls don't get this, even if they have this genetic uh, 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 type. So the question is, why is the effect only specifically observed in boys? Testosterone may be contributing increasing the rate of uptake as suggested by the lower urinary excretion of mercury. It is not the presence of the CPOX gene alone. It's not that. It's what else you have going on that increases this. And if you look at the data from the same children's amalgam trial, and this is what infuriates someone like me as a scientist. If you have a collection of boys and girls, gender sectors, and you look at the and you look at the mercury level, so you, what they got the composite fillings. This is what this is. This is the mercury in the urine from composite filling. It's not significantly different from boys and girls. 
but if you put in amalgam fillings, the girls start excreting a lot of mercury, and they maintain the ability to excrete mercury totally across the seven years of the study. The boys don't excrete nearly as much as the girls, and then it slowly goes down as they age and they get more testosterone in their system to at the end where they're not excreting this amount of mercury. Wouldn't you think that an intelligent medical community would say, where in the hell is that mercury going? They're not getting rid of it. If you remember earlier talks I did with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, usually it's what dies where you die of sudden cardiac arrest. I mean, you don't have a heart attack. Usually the people who die, all of them that I know of, are young boys participating in athletics. And when you test their heart tissue, they have 178,000 uh, 400 nanograms of mercury per gram of tissue, whereas people who die of other forms of cardiac arrest have eight. The mercury is concentrating in their heart tissue, and you do not find that mercury exhibited in their blood or their urine. So we can collect mercury, as just as this data shows, at very, very high levels in the body, in different organs, and the blood and urine levels don't mean very much at all. I mean, they tell you that you've been exposed, but they don't tell you. I mean, you could have two people with the same blood level and one having, uh, getting ready to die of sudden cardiac death because he's collecting it and it's not being excreted from his heart, and the other one's excreting it effectively and is doing well. As a matter of fact, there was a conundrum years ago on a study of people that were exposed I mean, to a very acute level of mercury in a, a, an industrial accident. And what they were surprised is they said the people that were the most exposed, i.e. the people who had the most in their urine, were the ones that got better. The ones who were less exposed, i.e. had less mercury in their urine, uh, didn't. they didn't, couldn't understand it. Well, it's not a measure just of the exposure, it's also a measure of how well you excrete. And <clears throat> when you see data like this, I, I would tell you there, there's no excuse for our FDA to be housed or our CDC to be housed with scientists or people who complain to be scientists and medical doctors, they would be so damn stupid as to say this indicates that this is safe for all children. There's no excuse for it. And so here's the picture. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm, I push a lot of biology because I... I I don't want people saying I, I, I short sold them. Here's the site of UP inhibition by mercury right here on the inner side, inner membrane of the mitochondria. This is also the site where you have ATP synthesis. And in here's where you have the citric acid cycle where pyruvate goes in and produces all the energy to make ATP and uh, do a lot of things. And then we kick out, they say it's this, this slide wrong, by the way, showing us kicking out ATP. Uh, it actually leaves with phosphocreatine. I mean, there's reasons for that, but, uh, they, but it is energy. It's the energy that's produced. When mercury goes in, this doesn't happen. You don't make this. Instead, this pathway here that catalytically produces energy in the, that will end up in the form of ATP starts producing hydroxy radicals that destroys the mitochondrial DNA, leaks out of the mitochondria, destroys your cells, your, your tissues, and everything else. This is where the cytotoxicity of mercury primarily exists. And we're going to show you how it does that, because it's, it's really pretty simple. But I want you to know, is oxidative stress related to illnesses? Autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, essentially every neurological illness has an oxidative stress as a symptom. I mean, all autistic children, everyone will agree, suffer from oxidative stress. Alzheimer's is it. Arthritis is accompanied by oxidative stress. Most liver and kidney. I can't tell you one disease that is not affected. So we can say disruption of this primitive biochemical system is associated with about every systemic illness. You cannot live without making energy, you die. But you can live with oxidative stress. You, you know, I mean, it's poor quality of life, but you can live. And so it's associated with this. And this is the one thing, uh, if you go to a doctor, I know I went to my doctor. I was taking the, this compound, NBMI, and I wanted to know what my glutathione levels were. And I asked him, I want this test. I want you to send it off. And he says, I don't do that. He said, no, how? I said, well, what do you mean? I, know, I can tell you where to get it done. And I said, why don't you do that? He said, I can't do anything about it. There's the, there's the concept that we have to change, and it has to be changed at the NIH. 
Oxidative stress is critical, and it may be, it can be caused by a lot of different things, not just mercury. There's a lot of things that cause oxidative stress. But if we have a, a medical uh, establishment that says, oh, oxidative stress is everywhere. It's associated with every disease. Unless you're healthy, it's going to be there. And you can do something about it. And that's where, uh, you know, if the government would just kind of lease it up and, and let people decide what's a good food and talk about it and say this will relieve your oxidative stress, we might get some progress made in this area. Uh, but we can say that the disruption of this primitive biochemical system is there. So this, this is uh, for me to be able to make a, another kick in the rear end of our National Institutes of Health. The effect of mercury dental amalgams feelings on renal and oxidative stress biomarkers in children. I want to point out, published in 2012, this is 2012 for use that are mercury toxic and don't follow these kind of things. It, it was done in Saudi Arabia, not exactly known as a scientific capital of anything that I know of. And what they found in here, I mean, and I don't want to read it, but this is just published. So our data provide evidence that low exposure to mercury from dental amalgam fillings exerts an effect on kidney tubular function in children. Oxidative stress may have played a role in this mechanism, indicating they don't know much about biochemistry. And in, in what they did, they examined the effect of mercury-associated amalgam films and biomarkers of renal and oxidative stress in children between the ages of 5 and 15 and a half years. This was done in 2012. We could have done this in the United States in 1960. I know. I mean, I was kind of intellectually active with biochemistry and chemistry at that time. So why hasn't this been reported in the United States? Why do we have to go to Saudi Arabia to get data that is simple? You, you take urine from a child, you count the number of amalgam fillings have, and you say, are there proteins being excreted in that urine that indicate renal or liver failure? Been done forever. This tells you how bad our government is. This tells you how much the ADA has been successful at suppressing any type of the simplest research that could be done to show mercury toxicity. They're criminals. I mean, you, you, you have to call them either criminals or they're, they're stupid as hell. I mean, there can be no other explanation that this data, and we're talking about urinary porphyrin profiles, this is even more direct, can be done, and it can be supported and concluded uh, uh, very easily. We have a problem in this country, and the problem is we have turned the FDA and the CDC are captured agencies. They're captured by people who want to make money. And they will not do work that is really in the benefit of the American public. And we have to change that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, sorry, I didn't mean to get off. I mean, I, I did feel upset about this. But here's one that, that fits into this. Oxidative stress-related markers in autism, systematic review and meta-analysis are done again in 2012, done in Italy, not in the United States. And if you look at this, it says amalgams increase oxidative stress markers. Wait a minute. Existing evidence suggests the role for glutathione metabolism, transmodulation, and the transsulfuration pathway, uh, although these findings should be interpreted with caution. What they're saying is that the ASD uh, patient showed a decrease in blood levels of reduced glutathione by 27%. Glutathione peroxidase by 18%, methionine by 13, cysteine by 14, and increased concentrations of oxidized glutathione, 45% relative to controls. And what this is telling you is that autistic children are suffering from oxidative stress. That oxidative stress, as we're going to show you, can lead to a plethora of problems, including the oxytocin, uh, uh, including the uh, urinary porphyrin profiles, heme, etc. So we have to look at this, and we can't be stupid. And, and I, want to take, I want to encourage you, you know, if you want to hurt my feelings, come up and say, Dr. Haley, you said something that was stupid. That hurts. You can call me a SOB and hell, yeah, I mean, to certain people I am. Our FDA and the CDC, you have to start calling them what they are. They're stupid. You, 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 there's no other explanation for this. That is out there. This is just a little bit of it. And it's all coming from foreign countries. Why isn't our... FDA and CDC and the NIH studying these things. Okay, this is the only one we talked about the iron problem. And what, well, what I'm trying to bring out here is that there have been several publications showing that we have excesses of zinc, 
copper and iron in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. They never look at the mercury. I mean, they just don't measure. I can tell you it's there, it's elevated. And that'll be coming out in, uh, keep, keep track of Randall Moore's movie. You're gonna see something in there that will surprise you. But what this says is that chelation therapy may be one therapeutic option because we're getting all of this copper, zinc, and iron. How does it get in? It can't go through your gut without being bound to protein. And we're having free, this is unbound, toxic iron and copper. And so why do essential metals build up in the nervous system? If you lose, the, it has to be due to the loss of compartmentalization by mercury and other toxin disrupted intestinal membranes and the free flow intake of excess of essential metals found in our diets. Because iron, if you, if you were to take a brain, homogenous, and look at it, iron is essential for the brain to work. But if you add free iron to that brain membrane, you'll see toxic effects because there isn't the protein there that it's supposed to be bound to. There isn't enough to compensate for it. So what does the science show us? Mercury from dental amalgams causes renal issues related to oxidative stress. Oxidative stress abnormal glutathione levels are found in autistic children and many other neurological diseases. Urinary porphyrin profiles are a good indicator of mercury reaching the mitochondrial in inner membrane and causing a toxic effect on heme production. And urinary porphyrin profiles indicate mercury toxicity in autistic as well as many other neurological diseases. And we ask the question, is there a rational scientific explanation for this occurring? And mercury compounds by passing through the cell membrane disrupt the cell structures and destroy the tight junctures. And this is a, <coughs> this is really the key issue that we have to deal with. Uh, this is a Frederick Schiller, against stupidity, the gods themselves contend in vain. And I think that's the way that sometimes I feel when I, when I go and I look at a guy from the FDA and, and explain to him, you know, you, you can't show me one study done on a rat or a mouse or a guinea pig with mercury that hasn't shown that it's toxic. And yet when I come to you with children and the problem that mercury is coming out of amalgams and we've explained that to you, we we'll say, well, you haven't proven anything, you know. It's called the lack of the precautionary principle. Something that's toxic in a rat is going to be toxic in a human. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time. And they ignore that. They say, oh, you can't consider that. I mean, I, I would say, no, you don't. But, but if you don't, you're stupid. And that's what we have to start calling them. I mean, I think we all have to start working on that. Uh, the, they, they ignore the precautionary principle that, you know, if they want it in there, let me tell you, if you try to invent the drug and get it through and get it approved, they, they practice the precautionary principle then. But it depends on how much money is coming in the back door from the lobbyists as to whether or not they will ignore it. And in the case of the mercury uh, exposure from uh, vaccines and from uh, amalgam fillings, they ignore this. I mean, just go, go read the literature. They're not caring about it. The possible center, and they don't even consider the possible synergistic effects of toxic injuries preclude this as a reasonable approach. In other words, you, you listen to uh, the one of the speakers yesterday talked about fluoride toxicity. I mean, any chemist would tell you, I mean, we keep fluoride in plastic bottles. You put it in glass, it'll eat it. I mean, fluoride is considered a tremendous toxin to chemists. They would scare the daylights out of us. And then we put it in the water and feed it to our kids, even though the data, when I look at it, I'm just flabbergasted at how, how they can sit and say, well, it's toxic at this level, but we cut down here, it's not toxic. I mean, you know, what, what happens if you put fluoride with mercury? I can tell you what happens if you put iron with mercury. I mean, the mercury is much more toxic in the presence of a small excess of iron or lead or any other heavy metal. And I think fluoride probably would exacerbate the toxicity of mercury. And here's a, uh, another thing that, uh, I, again, I don't know how they ignore this. Uh, activated metal metal metalloproteinase is involved in numerous inflammatory diseases and this is if you look them down here ovarian cancer uh, Alzheimer's disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis MS uh, I can't, aortic aneurysms uh, atrial fibrillation pathogenesis of coronary artery disease among the pathogen destruction of matrix and uh, numerous uh, disease states including breast and squamoma, squamous cell carcinoma in other words, activation of this enzyme is associated with a huge number of illnesses. Not my work, published in a lot of, these are all refereed publications. 
And we showed very early on that ethyl mercury and ethyl mercury both activate a common form of MMT. This is what chews up the collagen in between your cells and induces leaky, I mean, it's one of the factors in inducing leaky cells. And if you want to see how we did it, it wasn't very hard. This is the gel, and now stick with me. I don't let this blow your mind. But this is collagen with MMP with no mercury added. You can see, you see the protein is still there. If you add mercury, it chews it all up very quickly. Mercury activates this enzyme dramatically. And if you put in thimerosal at very, very low levels and increase it, and you get out here, thimerosal or ethyl mercury activates this enzyme that chews up the collagen that holds your cells in the tight junction. And so why, what are they looking at? They're, look, they're trying to make drugs to inhibit this enzyme. Well, why don't you just keep mercury out and it'll not, I mean, the body inhibits it. But mercury will activate. It's in your body in an inactive form. You put mercury in and you activate that enzyme and you start seeing the breakdown of the, the membranes in between it. So, uh, so now we're going to talk about <clears throat> how uh, some studies we've done with Ohio State University showing how these enzymes break, I mean, how these membranes break down with a little bit of mercury. And we're going to talk about uh, NBMI. NBMI used to be called OSR number one, and we're trying to get it approved as a, a, a treatment for uh, acute mercury toxicity. But what we can show here is mercury, methylmercury, and thimerosal lead to phospholipase deactivation and signaling, uh, and signaling loss of intracellular glutathione and corresponding loss of cytosol structure some to that observed in cardiovascular disease. This is published in Journal of Toxicology. It's Dr. Perinati. Some of you heard him speak here. Uh, we can say that NBMI at 50 micromolar effect had no toxic effect on the cells of the membrane structure. Methylmercury and ethylmercury given as thimerosal at 5 to 25 micromolar had dramatic toxic effects on cells, membranes causing leaky membranes. NBMI at 50 micromolar effectively prevented the toxic effects of methylmercury, ethylmercury, preventing leaky membranes. Other chelators do not have this matching protective effect. I was pointing out, I have not seen ever in my life, and I, I was highly funded in I one request from the National Institutes of Health to develop more effective chelators for mercury. Even though we know that mercury induces the same uh, biochemical abnormalities that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, and cardiovascular disease. And here's, here's part of the thing. This is a control, and if you, uh, this is the glutathione levels in the cells, and control cells have quite a bit. If you feed them NBMI, it goes up. I mean, I'd say that it probably is helping those cells. It's getting them more reduced in size. If you add ethyl mercury or methyl mercury here at 10 micromolar, this level goes down to here. If you have NBMI, 50 micromolar, it has no effect at all. If you add thimerosal, it's in your vaccines that are in, when you take your flu shot, you get this. You, your glutathione levels drop from here to here in this test system. And if you have NBMI present, it doesn't drop. It, I mean, it still stays above the normal level, indicating that if you can, you can treat mercury toxicity. It can be treated. We just need to put, uh, I, I think the real fear of it is if you do treat it, you might eliminate the need for a lot of drugs that people are now using. And the NBMI attenuation of mercury induced cytotoxicity, this is a measure of cell death. The control cells aren't dying, and when they die, they induce a color reaction, and you can see it goes up. If you put in NBMI, it doesn't cause anything. It doesn't cause any cell death. Uh, it's, it's the same level. And if you, uh, <coughs> I mean, it actually prevents the death induced by mercury, methylmercury. Methylmercury, uh, uh, I mean, if, if we didn't have NBMI there, it would be all the way up to here, indicating this is a high level of cell death. Uh, N-acetylcysteine doesn't stop it. DMSA doesn't stop it. You have to have a chelator that gets inside the cells, hydrophobic. These two, they chelate, they bind mercury, but they're, they don't get inside cells. So this is the one study and one thing that we're trying to do. Now, here are the pictures. The red you're seeing here is... Uh, cytoskeletal rearrangement stress factors. And if you have control and you add methylmercury, 5 micromolar, 10 micromolar, you see all these stress factors uh, uh, being produced. If you put in NBMI, it has no effect on the control cells, but if you have it in there, when you add the methylmercury, it totally prevents that reaction. And this is something 
we can give this, we've given this to as high as five grams per kilogram body weight to a rat without any toxic effect. It's totally without any, we've not been able to find anything about it that causes any toxicity. So you can have it in your body every day, all day, and you're looking at a guy that's been taking it every day for five years. For good reason. I, I really do understand the biochemistry going on here. If again, if we look at MBI, it protects against mercury induced cell morphology alterations. And again, all of this is uh, published. This is the control. You put in NBMI, 10, 25, 50, no toxic effect. If you add methylmercury to the control, you get this toxic effect. You go to 10, it goes here. If you have NBMI present with it, it's decreased dramatically. If you double the concentration here, it's eliminated. And at 50, it's eliminated. So there are, with in-house studies on membranes that are grown over an electrode, you can show that this compound, this one doesn't show so good, but I, I want to put it on here because it does point out uh, that uh, mercury induces induced phospholipase D translocation. And this down here, this, you see the green, that's where you're having problems. And this was with the Marisol. This is methylmercury, and you can see even with the Marisol, if you add the NBMI, I know that doesn't show up so well, I thought it would show up better than that. But NBMI stops the toxic effects of ethyl mercury release from the Marisol in this investigational system. Now, where this is important, the tie-in and how Dr. Paranata gets his funding is that this is the endothelial membrane that we're talking about. This is a yellow colored material that lines your arteries. And when you make that leaky, you get a collection and you get an atherosclerotic plaque started because you get periodontal bacteria in there, you get smooth muscle cells going in there, you get oral bacteria, calcium products, macrophages transformed into form cells that get in there to try and block the immune response of the leakiness of that membrane. And what you're seeing is a tremendous immune response to a leakage of something from the inside, from the smooth muscle cells on the inside of this, going into the bloodstream, you get a tremendous immune response, oxidative stress markers, and plus you set up a site for bacterial to infect it. Now, many of you have talked about vitamin D and how the big mystery in the United States is why is there vitamin D levels? I mean, did somebody shut the sun off? No. But, you know, one thing that's happened in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years is that the increase in mercury in our atmosphere has increased dramatically. I mean, you can't find fish in the Rocky Mountains in which there are no dentists up there. There's no coal fired power plant up there. The mercury level in those fish has gone up dramatically. And it's happening because of mercury coming across from the increase in coal fired power plants in China, Malaysia, North and South Korea, uh, and the Philippines. And that's coming across from what they call the Mongolian plume, comes across down from Alaska and down across the United States. And so we are having a non point source increase in mercury in the bodies of Americans. Uh, some of you remember uh, Dan Lack's talk about that. In 2000, the National, Insta the National Health and Nutritional Evaluation Survey pointed out that 2% of women, American women, now had detectable levels of mercury in their blood. First time they'd ever detected inorganic, not from fish, inorganic mercury. In 2006, the same inhane study, as he presented, showed that that percentage had gone up to 30%. So mercury is increasing, and mercury exposure is increasing to Americans, even though we don't have any increase in dental amalgams, etc. We are, the uh, humans of the world are making the world toxic, a very toxic and very uh, dangerous place to live by cause of these things. Vitamin D fights oxidative stress. I mean, it is good. It's a good material to take. But what does that tell you? That tells you that vitamin D in your body when you have oxidative stress, if you have mercury in your body increasing the production of hydroxy radicals, it's going to destroy your vitamin D and your vitamin D levels are going down. Now, vitamin D wasn't produced by the body to fight oxidative stress. It just does because it's hydrophobic. It gets inside the cells. It's, it's got a job to do. And if you deplete it by being mercury toxic, it can't do that job. It can't do the vitamin activities that it has to do. So this is something that uh, you can look this up. Just look up at vitamin D. And, uh, and its effect on endothelial function and oxidative stress in vitamin D deficient subjects. How does they get vitamin D, C, D, vitamin D deficient? You can set them in the sun, right? 
Well, it won't do you a damn bit of good if you're loaded with mercy. You're going to come down. It's going to be low. And you're going to have endothelial cell dysfunction. It says, we have shown vitamin D deficiency causes endothelial dysfunction right along with oxidative stress because vitamin D is deficient because of oxidative stress. Endothelial dysfunction is caused by oxidative stress and nothing better than mercury to en enhance that. Now, it's not only mercury that does it. There are other things that will do it. <clears throat> and this is a... Uh, something that uh, I do want to bring this up because I thought my talk was a little damn depressing, but uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher, and this is all truth, passes through three stages. First is, is ridiculed. Um, we're still being ridiculed, but there's some, uh, we're now being violently opposed. Uh, I can tell you there's some people that, are, that suggest that we should be violently opposed. And then it, it's third is accepted as being self-evident. And I think that's where we're getting today. Not so much in the United States, but in Europe. The Europeans really believe amalgams are toxic. They're getting rid of it. We have a government that's sold out to commercial interest, and we're, that's the only reason we're not getting rid of it, because the science sure as hell doesn't support their concept. So uh, regarding the IOMT stand against the amalgams, I think we're in the third stage. We just have to stand tight, and, and I think it's now time for us to stand, and someone says, amalgams are safe, and you say, you're stupid. Anybody, I, yeah. because, you know, because they get by this. They actually think they're smart. I have talked to some dentists who are not members of the IONT, and, and, and I, I, I can't believe they're so uneducated. And, and an uneducated person is what? Stupid. Yeah. And so you start telling them, you're stupid. You, you're killing your patients. You're making your patients sick. All the science, it's piled up so high and so deep. And the only thing they have is the people who want to continue selling amalgams and continue selling drugs go to the Washington, D.C., and I'm not real proud of our government at this time, and you take in a bunch of money and you can buy stupidity. You can buy stupid, you can buy it, you can formulate it. Uh, and so this is the one, this is the part, for those of you that are scientific oriented, that you need to take, pay specific attention to. Now, we're going to talk about how blood-located mercury compounds concentrate in cells about 5.6-fold and in the mitochondria by a thousand-fold over the blood levels. Because you remember this one Einstein, Pichero, and he says, well, tamarasol that you inject into a child leaves the body too fast to detox, leaves the blood too fast to detox it. It leaves it fast because your mitochondria look like a sponge soaking the mercury out of the blood. And when it gets into the mitochondria, it causes all kinds of problems. And uh, so uh, what, uh, I, I, I just want to go through this and here uh, to explain this, because this is rather complex. And I give this talk to other people that and I go a lot slower. Uh, but if you have mercury, ethyl mercury, with a positive charge, with a, you know, combined with a chloride with a negative charge on the outside of a plasma membrane, the membrane potential is 45 millivolts. That 45 millivolts, or the level of that uh, membrane potential is determined by the level ratio of positive charges on the outside versus negative charges on the inside. And so 45 is what you find in most of mammalian cells. But what this does, it pulls this uncharged molecule through the lipid bilayer. When it gets over here with the negative charges, because it's positively charged, it stays there. It doesn't want to go back. It doesn't want to leave those negative charges. Once it gets inside the, the cytoplasm, it's sitting there, and it's now with an inner membrane, uh, I mean the mitochondrial membrane, which is 180 millivolts. And what that means is that the negative charges in a cell are primarily concentrated on the interface of the mitochondrial membrane. And this sucks that mercury from the same process as this, gets chloride, and it pulls it through and it concentrates it in the mitochondria by a thousand fold. And this is a Sharp et al. Journal of Toxicology just this year. And this is the Nernst equation. Now I'm sure most of you don't sit around your dinner table talking about Nernst equations. But I lived with this stuff for a long time when I was at Yale in the Department of Physiology. It's very well, uh, very, very, very well believed in the, the scientific community that you can use this potential to determine the concentration of any molecule on the inside and the outside if allowed to come to equilibrium. And so you can look at the mercury on the inside and out by using this equation in a more complex form than this if you want it. But it, it's real science. I mean, it's not, uh, it, this is not woo-woo science. And so what we can say is that mercury in the blood can concentrate in the mitochondria at least a thousand fold. 
when it gets into mitochondria, the highest concentration of sulfur in your body is in the electron transport system. They're called iron sulfur centers. They line the inner mitochondrial membrane and they transport electrons and they allow you to make ATP from electrons derived from the citric acid cycle in the form of NAD and FADH2. So if we look at this, we can say when this molecule gets inside the mitochondria, and this is what Sharp's journal article is about, which is not the only one to say, that it starts reacting with sulfur and it sucks it in even more. Because once it binds to one of these iron sulfur centers, it's no longer in concentration. It's excluded from this, and so you pull more mercury from the outside to the inside. And uh, I, I put this up, and I know that uh, some of you have seen this, and you, you think, this is what made me sick when I was in graduate school. But the first step of, of glycolysis, glycolysis is located in the cytosol, compartmentalized there, produces pyruvate, and pyruvate goes into what are called the pyruvate uh, decarboxylase complex, which requires uh, lipoic acid. Lipoic acid contains two SH groups and binds sulfur, and it is the most uh, actively inhibited step in the glyco glycolysis pathway going into the citric acid cycle. And it inhibits that. And it allows uh, the breakup or the buildup of uh, pyru uh, uh, lactic acid and pyruvate because you don't get rid of it and can lead to problems. But in here in the citric acid cycle, all we want to say, this is compartmentalized inside the mitochondria. And the ubiquinone, which everyone's trying to get you to take, is uh, it's a mobile electron carrier that's involved in uh, this part of the citric acid cycle, which is also a part of the electron transport system. But the, the, problem, the problem I'm trying to say, if you concentrate mercury a thousand-fold higher out here, there isn't an enzyme in this system that would not be inhibited by mercury. Not a one. And so you're concentrating mercury in the mitochondria, which is your major energy. And if you're suffering from chronic fatigue, lack of energy, inability to repair and fight off infections, inability of the immune system to work, you are concentrating the mercury from your blood into this rod. And here's the total reaction. And I don't want to go, I mean, you can get, anybody can get my slides, by the way. You all know, I, I leave them with the IAMT, and anybody that asks one, welcome to them. I mean, uh, I don't uh, say things I don't do. Uh, but here's another aspect of this to try and make this picture a little more clear. Glycolysis, pyruvate, goes into the citric acid cycle. Citric acid cycle goes around, produces NADH, NADH, and FADH2. They go into the electron transport system, which is compartmentalized into the membrane. And this takes oxygen that you breathe. Wait a minute, right here. Uh, I've got to find it here somewhere. Huh? What? Uh, oh. It's, it's on this last step here, anyway. Oh, here it is. Half oxygen molecule and converts it to water. This oxygen is the oxygen that you're breathing. And uh, uh, to, to make it bounce chemically, we make it a half of a molecule of oxygen, which is impossible to create. But anyway, it gets reduced to water, and you make ATP. If this oxygen, if this system is blocked, this oxygen builds up in here. And if mercury comes in and knocks the iron off of these iron sulfur centers in this location here, this iron will transfer an electron to this, making a superoxide anion here. The superoxide anion is converted to hydrogen peroxide. If you have free iron knocked off of the sites by mercury, this iron will go to Fe2 to 3, gives up its electrons, and you produce a hydroxy radical, which depletes your glutathione. So when you have lower glutathione levels and high oxidized glutathione, it's because this whole system has been screwed up. And, you know, and to screw it up, you've got to get there, and you've got to have the power to knock iron off of the iron sulfur centers. And mercury is the only thing that can do that, that I know of. It's the only thing that does that. And this is just a more complex explanation, because I thought maybe these would be published in a thing here. But it, it's all good, solid chemistry. It's well known. This is how the NADH gives its electron. This electron flow goes down through here, making these things. And you take a half molecule of oxygen to a molecule of water. And the pH being formed as AT is made. If you inhibit that, you don't make ATP. You run out of energy. This oxygen builds up. It gets converted to superoxide anion, to hydrogen peroxide, and then to hydroxy radicals by this process. And we can, we can monitor this by the level of glutathione that's inside the body. Now, if conventional wisdom that uh, as, you old, as you age, 
your glutathione levels drop. If your glutathione levels drop, you're more susceptible to viral infections, any kind of illness that comes along. So you, if you want to maintain your health as an old person getting old, you want to take stuff and eat the kind of diet and avoid the things that lower your glutathione levels, keep them up, and you will, you'll, you'll maintain your health. That is really the key to maintain your health. Keep your glutathione levels high. If it's high, then you know that you're not having any oxidative stress and it's working quite well. And this is just what I'm talking about. Mercury comes in and we know it blocks this process. These electrons are coming through from our citric acid cycle and from the healthy diet we eat. The more NADH we produce by a good TCA cycle, the more electrons we donate and the more electrons we get combined with oxygen to make superoxide anion and produce more hydroxy radicals. I mean, you cannot eat your way out of oxidative stress. This is, you can't do it. For example, I, I know someone asked me today, I, I made a comment that uh, vitamin B12, you know, it, you know, some people want to take that. And I said, mercury toxic is not going to do anything. Because it's not the vitamin B12 that's low in autistic children. You can feed them all the B12 you want. They don't make methyl B12, and that's the active form of the bottom vitamin that makes S-adenosomethionine, that makes us, allows us to methylate DNA, proteins, and RNA. So when you have, when you eat vitamin B12 and mercury, which has a one nanomolar binding constant to methionine synthetase that puts methyl, the methyl group on B12 to make methyl B12, you can't eat your way around that. You can take all the vitamin B12 you want injection. You have to bypass it and take methyl B12. And so I'm not against B12, but understand if you're fighting mercury toxicity, you can eat all the good diet you want. And, and you're just not going to get better. <clears throat> this is from, uh, 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 again, Sharp et al. And I, I draw different pictures, but he has, I think, maybe better pictures. And what he's talking about is if you have these iron sulfur centers inside the, the, the uh, complexes of the electron transport system, and then you put in methyl mercury, the methyl mercury looks like this. It comes in and it knocks off free iron, and then it blocks the electron transport system. So it produces iron, it's displaced by mercury, and can now catalyze the production of free radicals via the Fenton reaction, and it prevents electron through the uh, flow through the electron transport system and prevents ATP production. So it's a double whammy. This is the bottom reaction. Remember, to make hydroxy radical, you have to have a metal ion that can give up an electron. Iron is the very best. This is called the Fenton reaction, and it's, uh, it can catalytically produce huge amounts from one mercury atom knocking one iron off of a, an iron sulfur center, releases this, and with the oxygen that you're breathing, forming the hydroxide, uh, pardon me, the superoxide anion, you can produce tons. I mean, many thousands of these for every iron that's escaped, and that's the reason you get uh, such an effect. So, and this is this is my one selling point. I'm I'm making this compound. I'm trying to get it approved as a drug. If you look at this process. NBMI will go in and bind to ethyl mercury. We showed that to you early on. It'll prevent it from being toxic. NBMI, also in our laboratory, binds free iron. So it, it blocks the step of toxicity here. And if you come down to here where the, the uh, ethyl mercury is now binding to enzymes that recover glutathione, it will bind and prevent uh, glutathione ethyl mercury uh, addicts from being made. So what we're trying to do is attack this from an intellectual viewpoint saying, Mercury, when it gets inside your cells, causes a lot of problems, and you've got to have something that can go there and reverse by binding it tighter than the sites that are there. I don't know that you can ever get ethyl mercury off of the, an iron sulfur center. That's when the mitochondria probably has to divide, stop and divide. So, <coughs> so here's the, the, uh, the total picture. Ethyl mercury from your nice vaccines or whatever one, or methyl mercury from fish or mercury from del amalgam shoots through here, is concentrated, a thousand-fold at least, inside the mitochondrial membrane where this electron transport system is existing. It comes down here, knocks off the iron, and shuts down the electron transport system. Electrons don't go through anymore, they build up, and then it releases uh, hydro I mean, superoxide anion from oxygen by giving the electron to the oxygen instead of uh, to water, and then it releases this iron at the same time. This combines with this, and it ends up producing hydroxy radicals. I realize this is very complex, but trust me, it's made it to the viewers and a lot of people, and it's appeared. So we, uh, I don't have enough time uh, 
to go through a lot of these things. Uh, I'm, I'm, how much time do I have? I'm done. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I got one. I got one more slide, and this is how vitamin C helps you, and and how vitamin C and E does this. But I'm going to go to one more. Oh, here, this this is rather important. When your mitochondria are screwed up because you've got a bolus of mercury, as you saw from uh, Randall Moore's movie, by having an amalgam replaced, these mitochondria, the only way you recover is that the good mitochondria, the ones that aren't damaged, have to divide and make new mitochondria in your cells. You, you, don't, uh, you don't take a sick mitochondria with mercury in it and recover it. You bury it. You take it and tear it apart. And uh, I wouldn't talk about that level, but and these, this is, again, the mercury coming over the plume into the United States, so we're having a problem. But um, this is this is my last statement. And it, it's a sense of humor. Uh, I'm Irish and American Indian. That's my genetic makeup. And I don't know which one's causing me to be the way I am, but I think a lot of the are. But I, I'm I'm an American philosopher, self-declared. I mean, nobody nobody else agrees with me, maybe. But I just because I want to I want to talk about stupidity. And stupidity is rapidly accepted if it fits into the political dogma of the time. So you control the political dogma. The American Dental Association has done this very well. Amalgams are safe, and people like Boyd Haley and uh, Rich Fisher, Phil Sukell, and all these other little parts around here, uh, they're, they're crazy people. I mean, they're just, they're just uh, crazy. So don't accept their dogma. They control the dogma today. And stupidity can be promoted with large amounts of cash. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Go to Washington, D.C., and you run into it. There's just a lot of it. It's even more, stupidity is even more rapidly and uniformly accepted if it is promoted by a government agency. And this is our FDA, CDC, uh, even the NIH. I throw them in there, and I like the NIH for the most part. Uh, it's more, you know, stupidity is more universally accepted as a fact if it is a promoted by a medical authority. And, uh, and I think that fits the CDC. They say this, some, I mean, I would never, when you guys, I remember Dave Kennedy remembers, first told me that amalgams were putting mercury in my body. I said, ADA wouldn't have you do that to me. They're American Dental they're, they're worried about my health. The hell they are. Yeah. And the last one here is one, stupidity cannot be cured, but it can be eliminated. And this is our only hope. We have to eliminate the sources of stupidity, which is money put into the government, health agencies to support uh, the sale of things that just make money for a small group of people, but they concentrate that money in Washington, D.C., and they overwhelm, you know, the objective look at science. They just eliminate it. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Haley.